<clears throat> Psalms 128 is where we're going to start. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is everyone who fears, reveres, and worships the Lord, who walks in His ways and lives according to His commandments. You'll eat the fruit of the labor of your hands, happy, blessed, fortunate, enviable shall you be, and it'll be well with you. Your wife, she'll be like a fruitful vine in the innermost parts of your house. Your children will be like olive plants round about your table. It goes on to say, Behold, thus shall the man be blessed, fears the Lord. So, so there is a way, this is very good news, because this is telling us there's a way where you can be blessed, you can be happy, you can be enviable, and it'll affect your wife, it'll affect your husband, it's going to affect your kids. And I think, you know, nobody in here, when they get married, they just say, well, you know, I really want to have a miserable marriage and end up divorced with three kids. No, nobody goes into marriage that way, nobody thinks that way. But unfortunately, uh, you know, the statistics show that about one out of two Christian marriages end in divorce. And, you know, I, I don't know if I agree 100% with those statistics, because there's a lot of people that think they're Christians that are not. They just attend church, and you can sit in church and not be a Christian, just like you can sit in the garage and not be a car. <laughs> and so the statistics can be a little bit skewed, but at the same time, uh, there's a lot of people that are church attendees that are really Christians, and unfortunately, their marriages end. And, uh, but there are some good things about this, because if you look at this particular scripture, it's telling us there's a way that you can live and a path that you can follow. You can walk in the ways of God and have a blessed marriage. You can have a blessed family. You can be a blessed person. So it is possible for us to have that. In fact, I was reading some other statistics I thought were very interesting. They said that um, for those that uh, have daily prayer and Bible reading in their home. Now, we've been trying to get you to do just five days a week read one chapter five days a week, and in a year you can read through the entire New Testament. So, so, but they did the study. They said for those, and these are people that I would call disciples. You know, I, I'm, I'm wanting you to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, act like him, follow his teachings. So the, this, this survey said that only one out of 300 marriages failed when they had daily prayer and Bible reading in their home, and they attended church two times a week. Only one in 300. Well, then there must be something that you can do. There must be a, choices you can make, a life you can live, decisions you can make that are going to greatly enhance and bless you and your spouse and your children after you. But, I mean, just the first part of that, they went to church twice a week, and they had daily prayer, in Bible reading, that eliminates a pretty big percentage of Christians. Are you here? Y'all quit shouting and sit down. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> but there is a way. But you just have to determine, hey, I'm going to walk in that way. How many of you think you can become a little bit more devoted? I mean, we're all on the road. We should all be on the road of growing and being disciples of Jesus. He's coming back for a glorious church. You going to be part of that? He's not coming back for a bunch of backslid weenies. Can I get an amen? amen? Come on. So we're growing up. We've been, we've been on that series. We've been growing up. So today we're just going to talk about a championship marriage. And so I'm going to talk about this a little bit. And I'm going to give you three points here. Number one is this. You need to define the object of the game. Now, in football, I mean, you advance the football down the field. You cross the opponent's goal line, thus scoring points and keeping your opponent from doing the same to you. Most points wins. We know the object of the game in most sports, football, you know, the object of the game. Have you ever sat down and thought about what's the object of marriage? Why, why did God come up with marriage anyway? I mean, what did he have in mind? What's the object of the game? What is the object of the game? What does the Bible say the object of the game is? I mean, if you don't even know the object of the game, how do you know if you're even playing it right? How you have a possibility of even having a championship. So I just looked and I, I'm, you know, I'm narrowed it down to three things that the Bible plainly says this is, this is one of the objects of marriage. And I'm just going to give you three, kind of an A, B, and C under the define the object of the game. And uh, so number one is this, or A, I guess, under number one, is marriage 
creates unity and synergy. You understand that it adds something to your life. It, it causes the sum of the two parts to be far greater than what the individuals could accomplish themselves. That's what synergy is. In Mark chapter 10, notice what Jesus said about this, beginning in verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God joined together, let not man put asunder. The, the word here, joined together, means to have a union or to be made complete. And you can see that, you know, every single one of us, men, we think differently. I've, I've got a book in my office that's called His Brain, Her Brain, and they've done studies on men's brains are different than women's brains. And, uh, you know, it, we're just different. And so together... You have a strength, you're able to see things by the time you discuss it and pray over it and look at scriptures and life's decisions together and make a decision. It can be, you can be much more effective at finding the wisdom of God in whatever you're dealing with. You can be much better at getting the right vision for where you need to be going and what you need to be doing and how you need to raise your kids and your family and how you need to respond to different things. It creates unity and it creates it creates this synergy to be able to accomplish the will of God for your life. Genesis 2.18, you remember, and I didn't give it to you guys. I think you found it for me, though. Thank you. The Lord God said, it's not good the man should be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable or adaptable to him. The word help here, actually the King James says a help meet for him. It means someone to support, to aid, or to surround. You remember... Um, I think it's in Ecclesiastes 4, somewhere around over there, verse 9 or so. It says something about two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. And it goes on to say, you know, if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that's alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. So, so having somebody to be there, you know, in life sometimes you, you face some tough stuff. I mean, you, you, you suffer some loss in life. If you haven't lived long enough to know it, let me just tell you something, baby. There's some loss in life. There's some things that hurt you in life. And how good it is to have somebody who's there who can just put their arms around you and say, I'm with you. We're going to get through this. God loves you. I love you. And I'm standing with you. And I'm with you. And you have this, this thing, this energy, this unity. The Bible even tells us that it, it's like unity is like, is like the anointing oil. It brings an anointing to accomplish in your life. So, so marriage is to complement each other, to complete each other. Uh, you know, a lot of things I think, my wife doesn't think. A lot of things that, you know, she thinks, I don't think. And we sit down and we think about it and we pray and we try to get scriptures. And I, I, can, I can look at the scriptures and try to find the wisdom of God in this. I mean, it's amazing. And in life, sometimes, like I said, you're hurt in life. Things happen. You suffer loss, and it's good to have someone there who to be with you. Marriage is for completeness. It's for unity. It's for energy and synergy to accomplish the will of God. Somebody to believe with you. Spiritually speaking, Matthew 18, 19, you remember what Jesus said, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it'll be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. There should be no greater agreement than a, than a man and his wife. I mean, because everything, you, you're, you should be united to where everything that you have is together. Those are your children. You're raising kids together. And you want the best for them. And you can agree about their life and their future and, and, and pray for them. When you see that they're getting off course, they're doing this, they're doing that, you can get in agreement. Your finances... Where are you going? What goals do you have? You can set goals. You can write it down. Belda has on, in our room, she has a, on one of the mirrors, she has this big cutout in there with all of these goals, things that we believe in God for, and she has them written down with the date we prayed and the date they got answered. There's power when two of you really agree on earth. I mean, when you really agree that it's done, I mean, you have somebody who stands in agreement with you and there should be no stronger agreement than a husband and a wife. So it's for unity. God brought them together to create energy and unity and faith together. They're using their faith together. You know, there's an Old Testament scripture that says, how can one chase a thousand and two ten thousand? That's synergy. 
the sum of the two parts is much greater than just what one individual could do. And you need that partnership in your life. That's one of the objects of the game, one of the purposes of marriage. The second thing is this about marriage. Marriage is to meet our sexual needs. I mean, sex is a very important part of our culture. It's an important part of life. I said, are you here? It's an important part of life. And if there was no sex, I mean, there wouldn't be any guys married. I mean, I'm just being honest. I mean, he wanted more than your hand when he married you. I'm just telling you. Are you here? Sex is important. God knew it was important. Sex is great, but it needs to be kept inside the marriage bed. So God, one of the purposes of marriage is for sex. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, notice what it says. Now I will answer the question you ask in your letter. You ask, is it best for people not to marry? The apostle Paul was celibate. If you keep reading here, he says he had a gift from God. I don't have that gift. Most people don't have that gift. If you've got that gift, you've got a lousy gift. <laughs> he had this gift. He was celibate. He wanted to stay. I mean, he never did marry. He devoted everything to God and praise God. There's some people like that. He says, well, having your own husband or wife should keep you from doing something what? Immoral. Husbands and wives should be fair with each other about having sex. Wife belongs to her husband instead of to herself. One translation says she, her body does not exclusively belong to her. And a husband belongs to his wife instead of to himself. So don't refuse sex to each other unless you agree not to have sex for a little while in order to spend time in prayer. Then Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Wow. So he, he says, hey, sex is important. You need to be having sex. You need to be having sex regularly. That way you won't be tempted because you, God wants to keep you from immorality. There's a lot of immorality in the world that we live in. But sin, the wages of sin has never changed. It's still death. And it'll mess your life up. And you may think that it's all right. Everybody's doing it. It's cool. There's no consequences to this. Baby, there is. There is. It'll show up. So God says, hey, we need to have sex is wonderful. It should be within the bounds of marriage. He wants you to have a great sex life. You know, I talk about this sometimes with married couples, and you've probably heard me say it, but it bears repetition. You know, they did a study of, of uh, because men have so much testosterone, they were looking at male mammals, and they did a study on male rats, and they put them in a cage. They had an electrical current going through the middle of the cage, and on the other side, they had, bread, they had food, and they had water. And they were seeing how much electrical current the male rats would cross over before they starved to death to get to food and water. And they would keep turning it up and the rats would try to get across. And they were just saying, you know, how much current can they pass before they'll get over to the bread and water? And I mean, it was pretty, before they starved to death, I mean, they had to turn it up pretty heavy. But then they did the same experiment again. This time they put a female rat on the other side instead of bread and water. And she was in heat when they put the male rats over here. And you know that they would cross more electricity to get to a female rat in heat than they did, they, they did for food before they starved to death. They actually burn their, some of them would burn their little feet off all the way up to the first joint trying to get over to the female rat. I mean, they got over there. They were crippled all up, but they got over there. <laughs> and I'm not saying that men are rats, but I am just saying they do have a strong sex drive. <laughs> are you here? And for, you know, studies show that for a man, his sex drive, especially, you know, when he's young, his sex drive is just as strong as his drive for food. You ladies ever went without food for three or four days? I have. Did you get hungry? You didn't have any, you didn't have any food. All you had was just maybe water. You can get hungry. Is that right or not? Well, men, I mean, their sex drive is just as strong for, for, for sex as it is to have food. In fact, if you don't believe it, when you get home today, ask him, do you want lunch? He won't go have sex. <laughs> you can just check it out. But the point is, I mean, sex is part of a marriage. If you're going to have a championship marriage, it has to involve sex, and it needs to be sex that's regular. Paul said, you know, don't defraud one another. Are you here? I'm just saying. 
I mean, you can, you can protect yourself and eliminate a lot of temptation, and that was the whole point of what he was saying in 1 Corinthians 7, if you have sex regularly. Because, I mean, if you're not having sex with your husband and he's traveling, going out of town, or he's working with somebody at work, and you haven't had sex in two weeks, that's like somebody not eating in two weeks. Well, every time she walks by, he smells a cheeseburger. <laughs> Are you here? Sex is good. God created it. And it should be part of your marriage. Why did he create? He created sex. He said to keep you out of immorality. He created that. He created marriage to keep you out of immorality. Amen. That's good preaching, Pastor. <laughs> you know, Dr. Gary and Barbara Rossberg, we had them here at church a while back. We got some of their books in our bookstore. Uh, they're very well known, got television shows, so on and so forth. But he said this, I thought it was very interesting. He said, sex plays a major role in helping men process life. I mean, I never thought about it. I knew that it made them feel better about themselves and their ego and so on and so forth. But he said, it helps clear a man's mind, helping him to solve problems. He said, women often solve problems by talking them out. Men think them out. And sex helps clear their mind and get all the junk out of their mind, get their mind to shut up and be quiet. And he said it helps them. I mean, it's helpful. It's beneficial. Not, all, not only that, all the good things that it does in your body, the endorphins and the things that it releases, sex is good and it's healthy for you and you need to be having sex. Can I get an amen from all the male voices in here? Amen. amen. All right. The third thing, I mean, what it, we're, we're looking at, what is the, I mean, what's the object of marriage? Well, I mean, it's supposed to bring unity to your life. It's supposed to be a way that you can have sex and not get yourself all messed up in sin. And the third thing is to have, you know, a great godly family. Have a great godly family, raising godly children. That's what the Bible says about it. Malachi chapter 2, notice what it says here. Malachi 2, beginning in verse 14. Here the prophet is uh, addressing the people and saying, well, the reason that God's not receiving your prayers, he's not taking your offerings is because of the way you're living. He says, yet you ask, why does he reject it or reject our offering? Because the Lord was witness to the covenant made at your marriage. Marriage is a covenant. It's not just some contract. It's not, well, you know, I think we'll just run out and get married real fast. No, it's a covenant and God was there. It says the Lord was witness to the covenant made at your marriage. The Lord was right there. The preacher was there. She was there. You were there. Maybe others were there, but somebody else was there. God was right there. And he said, it was a covenant between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously and to whom you were faithless. She's your companion, the wife of your covenant made by your marriage vows. And did God not make you and your wife one flesh? Did not one make you and preserve your spirit alive? Why did God make you two one? Why, why did God make marriage anyway? He said two will become one flesh. Why did God do that? Because he sought a godly offspring from your union. Oh. He wanted you then to raise godly offspring. Can you imagine how different the world would be if everybody that was born again, every couple that were really born again, if their children, they, they raised them and their kids were born again and their kids were born again and they all were disciples and all following the Lord. Can you imagine how different the world would be? That's what God was after. He wanted a godly offspring. Part of your responsibility is to raise godly children. You know, in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks to dads. It says in Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of them, but bring them up tenderly with loving kindness in the discipline and, and instruction of the Lord. You notice he addressed that to fathers. He said, fathers, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's your job. Well, I just, you know, I don't go to church. I, you know, I, I worked out in the world for 15 years. I'd hear guys, ah, you know, I don't go to church. I let my wife handle that stuff. She takes kids to church sometimes. I just let her do that. I'm making the money. Yeah, your life's a disaster too. No, he said, fathers, you, you bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. How much are you doing that? Well, I, I've instructed them about how to work on a car. Well, I mean, that's good. 
I instruct them about sports. I instruct them about this. I know, but he told you your assignment was you're supposed to have godly kids and it's your job to instruct them in the things of God. And how seriously are you taking that? Because someday you're going to stand before the Lord just like I am. He's going to say, I mean, here's what I told you. Did you do anything about that? Can I get an amen? So, so it's for raising godly offspring. That's one of the reasons for marriage. All right, so the second thing, we're talking about what is the objective of marriage anyway? We looked at those three. And the second thing is this. If you're going to have a championship marriage, you need to have a great defense. Everybody say a great defense. We already know, you know, those of you that are involved in sports, there's been an old saying around for years, you know, offense wins games and defense wins championships. In fact, we saw that, I guess a couple of weeks ago, we saw the Kansas City Chiefs playing the Bengals. And in the second, I mean, it looked like Kansas City Chiefs had the game won. I mean, it's 24 to 3 or something. I mean, I thought the game was over. Next thing I know, the whole second half of the game, the defense of the Bengals totally shut down the offense of the Chiefs. Totally shut them down. Well, there's some things you need to shut down in your life and in your marriage and in your family and in yourself. Things you need to shut down if you're going to have a championship marriage. There's some things you need to defend yourself against and you need to defend your children against and your wife against. Notice over in Romans chapter 12, Beginning in verse 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. He said you're not supposed to be conformed to this world. One translation says, don't be poured into the world's mold. Now, I mean... We live in a culture, that's exactly what they want to do with you and that's exactly what they want to do with your kids is pour you into their mold. Is that right? And they want you to agree with whatever they they say and what they think and if you don't do it, I mean, they want to cancel you. And they want to call you every kind of name in the book and say you're a racist and you're, you're a hater and you don't agree, you don't embrace my sin. Hey, baby, no, I don't embrace your sin. Sorry. Wages of sin still death. There are still things that are right, still things that are wrong. And we live in a very screwed up society, very progressive, full of Unfortunately, a lot of communism and socialism and atheism in our country. And they want, they want to pour you into that mold and say, you can't say that. You can't believe that. You're a hater if you, if you say that that's wrong. No, 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 no. We're, we're not going to be canceled. Let me just tell you, the voice of the church, the voice of truth is not going to be canceled. When they're all gone, we'll still be here. When they're, when they're out reaping the life that they've sown and the truth that they embraced that was a lie, we'll still be here. The truth will stand forever because the truth is God's word. And we're not here to be canceled. Amen? But the world wants to pour you in that mold and if you don't fit in their mold, they're going to say, well, if you're this, you're that. We hate you. We'll cancel you. We'll ruin your job. We'll ruin your business. We'll protest. We're going to cancel. You better get in our mold. But if you're going to have a successful life and a successful family and a successful marriage, you you got to stay out of their mold and you got to defend yourself from it. Can I get an amen? amen? So a championship marriage requires that, a great defense. Notice over in Proverbs 7, this interesting passage. I was reading this and this just kind of jumped out at me. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and behold among the stupid ones I discerned among the youth a young man void of understanding passing through the street near her corner and he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and in the dark night and behold there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. She's loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Notice, now is she without, now in the streets and lieth in wait at every corner. Everybody say every corner. 
Now, you know, that applies exactly today, probably more than it ever has in the history, that there's temptation at every corner. Did you know that? I mean, used to be you kind of had to chase sin. If you wanted to watch pornography or look at pornography, you used to have to kind of go by, you know, I think, I don't know when Playboy came out, late 60s, 1971, the Supreme Court ruled there's no decency laws anymore. They did away with decency laws, and the country's been flooded with pornography since then. But back then, you had to go buy a magazine or something. Now, it's at every corner. I said every corner, there's temptation. Every corner, every corner on your cell phone, every corner in social media, movies, television, I mean, you, you, billboards, I mean, you can't hardly go anywhere. Every corner, you have this temptation for sin. And you got, you got to have a strong defense against it because it'll mess your life up. It'll ruin your marriage. Your, your wife is, I mean, you, you can, pornography causes you to want to compare your wife with, him, with her, compare your husband with him. And I mean, that's, that's all put on. It's all fake. Yeah, they may be having sex, but let me tell you something. Those models have more plastic in them. If they fell in the ocean, they'd float without moving a hand. <laughs> Are you here? And you've got to defend yourself, and you've got to defend your mind, and you've got to defend your family. Amen. That's good preaching, Pastor. Hallelujah. Amen. Notice what happened. Verse 22, Proverbs 7, 22. He goes after her. Straightway, as an ox goes to the slaughter, and as a fool, as a fool, to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare and knows not that it is for his life. You got to defend yourself. Wives, you got to defend your husband. Husbands, you got to defend your wife. You got to defend your kids. They're growing up in a world that has rejected Christianity and truth altogether. And I mean, you got you to protect them, man. You have to have a strong defense. And you got to keep some stuff out of your life and out of your mind and out of your family and out of your house. And if that means you have to cancel your movie channels, put guards or blocks on your phone, your kids' phones, know where they're at, what they're doing, where they're going. Sin is not okay. It still pays the same wages. It still pays death. Are you here? And you've got to defend yourself. And I mean, if you're working with somebody and you're attracted to a co-worker, you need to transfer. You need to get another job. It's not worth your marriage. If you're going to have a championship marriage, you've got to have a great defense. A lot of people want a championship marriage. There's a lot of athletes. They want to be the champions, but they're not willing to pay the price to get that. If you want a championship marriage, you've got to pay the price to get it. You've got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There's a way you've got to walk in. You've got to have a strong defense because the world's out there on every corner. You know, we took off this week and we went up to Disney, took our family up there, and I found out apparently I'm not all up to speed on my Disney princesses. There was Cinderella and Snow White. I don't know what has happened now. Everybody and their dog is a princess. <laughs> so my granddaughter, she was telling me all about, she's four years old, telling me all about these princesses, telling me who that was. That was she got over this one. She says, that's Booty and the Beast. I said, I, I think it's Beauty. She said, Booty and the Beast. <laughs> so we walked around Disney, and you know what? I saw Booty, and I think the Beast was right there with him. Big old guy, about six foot four, had tattoos everywhere. But we live in a culture. We live in a world like that. You've got to defend yourself. I mean, if you, if you can't eat sugar, don't hang out at the donut shop. Are you here? Where, where are you going? Who are you hanging around? What are you looking? What are you hearing? What, what are you feeding? Amen. Third thing is this. You've got to have a great offense. I mean, if you do have a great offense, there are a few great offenses in football, but if you have a great offense, I mean, you control the ball. The, the other team doesn't even hurt. I mean, they get three punts and they're out. 
you, you, if you have ball control and you're, you are always on offense and you're eating up the clock, man, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be good. There's some great offensive tandems, you know, in history. You can look back some of the, the great quarterbacks and receivers that they have, you know, uh, Joe Montana and Jerry Rice. They were good back in the day. I thought it was interesting. I was looking at these, some of these statistics. You know, Troy Aikman and Michael Irvin are still number three on passing yards. Still number three all time, even after all these years. You have, uh, of course, Tom Brady and his great receiver is... Gr- Gronk, everybody calls him, Gronkowski or whatever his name is. Good. I mean, they scored 105 touchdowns over their career. Great offense. But you know who's number one? I mean, do you know who the number one tandem is of this quarterback and receiver? It's Peyton Manning and Harrison, 114 touchdowns. But you've got to have a good offense. A lot of times... You know, when, when a couple gets married, I mean, we stop doing the things that we should have been doing or the things we were doing all along. And we let those things slide. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain. I mean, if you want to have a great marriage, you, there's things you got to do, there's a way you got to live, things you have to do to obtain that. In Mark 10, verse 7, Jesus says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and mother and cleave to his wife. The word cleave means to keep, to stick to, and notice this, to catch by pursuit. You know, when you were dating, you were pursuing her, weren't you? Weren't you pursuing her? I mean, didn't you call? Didn't you take her out on dates? Didn't you buy her gifts? Didn't you get her cards? Didn't you buy her flowers? I mean, pretty much for a while, more than likely, your spare time was just ate up with her because you were pursuing her. Well, he said, that's supposed to last. You're supposed to cleave. You're supposed to continually pursue your wife. Same thing's true wives. I mean, you were pursuing him, weren't you? Weren't you calling? Weren't you trying to look your best? I'm not saying all everything wrapped up in how you look, but men are motivated by sight. And you need to, you need to have some negligees or <laughs> some kind of clothes that are for his eyes only. His eyes only. Because men are motivated by sight. You know, one lady said, she said, my husband, she told her husband, she said, when you, you, you know, when you come home from work, said you're, you're more excited to see the dog than you are me. He said, well, if you jump up and wag your tail, I'd be excited to see you. <laughs> you still got to pursue. You got to pursue. You got to have good offense. I mean, you already know men, I mean, they're wanting to have sex. If he's going to be gone, you need to you need to spend some extra time with him. You need to sex that boy up before he leaves on his business trip. <laughs> Pursue. It's amazing, you know, the guys, after they've been married a while, they forget their anniversary. Some of them forget their wife's birthday. They don't, you know, holidays. What about even just special occasions? It's funny, they can remember to get the oil changed in their car and they can't remember their wife's anniversary. The birthday? Huh? You still got to pursue. You used to look just right for him whenever you went out on a date. I mean, you'd spend a lot of time getting ready and makeup is right. And now, I mean, he comes home, you're wearing the only thing you're wearing is sweats all the time. Don't put your makeup on anymore. Hey, come on. You need to still pursue. You need to still pursue. And you still need to hold hands. And me and my wife hold hands all the time. We're walking, going anywhere. I'm holding her hand. You still need to open car doors. You still need to say, you're my sweetheart and I love you. M- women need a, uh, an emotional attachment. They need a connection. It's not just coming home and, uh, you know, we're just ready to jump in the bed. No, that's 
the garbage bin watching. They want to know that they're connected to you and that you love them and that there's intimacy in your relationship into me see. And you discuss your plans and your dreams and how your day went. And you need to have that in your life. You need to have that in your marriage. You got to have a good offense. And yeah, you need to have a date night. And if that just means going to the park, walking around, buying a Coke, having some sandwiches there, if you don't have money to go out and man a mirror, maybe really in a, in a fix financially, but have a date night. Spend some time together. Get somebody to watch the kids. She needs to know she's your sweetheart. She's your treasure. You, you still need to pursue her. You still need to pursue him. He needs you to brag on him. He needs you to think he's still a stud. Are you here? And in sports, you know, in football, I mean, it's not, it's not where the whole team, it's a team effort. It's not individual, just me, me. You know, it's me. It's all about me. No, it's a team. And you got to work together and find your role. And you need to be a team. You need to be devoted to each other. If you, if you want to have a, a championship marriage, she needs to know you're going to be there for the rest of your life and you're committed to her and you're not looking around everywhere you go at some other woman, some other girl watching other stuff. Are you here? You've got to have a good offense. In Ephesians 5, kind of summed up about marriage and it says this nevertheless let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself let the wife see that she respects her husband those two ingredients if you're going to have a good offense those got to be two ingredients in your marriage she has to give respect to her husband be respectful to him not ragging on him and telling him how stupid he is and why don't you ever do anything and I'll do what I want no you're out of line and you're never going to have a good marriage. You might live together, but you're never, your marriage will never be what God wanted it to be. And then, gentlemen, you have to love your wife even as Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for it. Amen. And you got to learn to love her and let her know you love her and spend time holding her and not just when you want sex. Some men think if the wind blows, that's foreplay and they're ready for sex. <laughs> no, you have to learn to hold hands and pat her on the back and Hug her up. Amen? You've got to have a good offense. So marriage. What is marriage? Marriage is God's idea. And it can be wonderful. It can be great. I'm so glad that I've been married for over 40 years. We've been married, and we're going to be married a long time. As long as we're on the planet, we'll be married. And I'll be there. And that doesn't mean that everything's great and yeah, I'm not, I don't look like I used to look when I was 16. I was really good. Them bell-bottom britches, they just set me off, baby. <laughs> but she still loves me. Amen? And I still love her. And we're going to be together. And if when you're here next year and next time I teach on family, she'll be here in 10 years and as long as we're on this planet. And your wife needs to know that you're there for her. She's not going to be perfect. You need to give her some grace. He's not going to be perfect. You need to let the Holy Spirit work on him and help him to grow. But we're committed. You need to have a good offense. Can I get an amen from you? Thanks so much for watching. If this message blessed you, be sure to share it with your friends and family and hit subscribe. For more information, head over to our website or click the link below.